and welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. My name is Omar Pinto, the host of the SHARE Podcast and a founding member of the SRC, the SHARE Recovery Community. In the SRC, we have a number of live online recovery meetings every week on a number of different topics. This podcast is only one example of the content provided to our members. In this meeting, a chapter of the Tao Te Ching is discussed every week as to how it relates to recovery. I hope you enjoy this week's podcast episode. Hey guys, Buddy C. This is the October 24th Tao Te Ching meeting for the Share Recovery community. We have Kate and Kirsty and Lala and Paul and Craig today. How are y'all doing this morning? Everybody good? Getting some thumbs up? Wonderful. Wonderful. We want to hear some slow talking today, Kirsty. We want some wisdom out of you. I'll keep it slow. <laughs> no pressure, Kirsty. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure at all, Kirsty. <laughs> all right. The sixty fourth chapter. Any comments before Kate reads or Okay, well we'll just let Kate have at it. Fire when ready, Kate. All right. 64th chapter. First translation. Peace is easily maintained. Trouble is easily overcome before it starts. The brittle is easily shattered. The small is easily scattered. Deal with it before it happens. Set things in order before there is confusion. A tree as great as a man's embrace springs up from a small shoot. A terrace nine stories high begins with a pile of earth. A journey of a thousand miles starts under one's feet. He who acts defeats his own purpose. He who grasps loses. The sage does not act and so is not defeated. He does not grasp and therefore does not lose. People usually fail when they are on the verge of success so give as much care to the end as to the beginning, then there will be no failure. Therefore the sage seeks freedom from desire. He does not collect precious things. He learns not to hold on to ideas. He brings men back to what they have lost. He helps the 10,000 things find their own nature, but refrains from action. Second translation. What is rooted is easy to nourish. What is recent is easy to correct. What is brittle is easy to break. What is small is easy to scatter. Prevent trouble before it arises. Put things in order before they exist. The giant pine tree grows from a tiny sprout. The journey of a thousand miles starts from beneath your feet. Rushing into action, you fail. Trying to grasp things, you lose them. Forcing a project to completion, you ruin what was almost ripe. Therefore, the master takes action by letting things take their course. He remains as calm at the end as at the beginning. He has nothing, thus has nothing to lose. What he desires is non-desire. What he learns is to unlearn. He simply reminds people of who they have always been. He cares about nothing but the Tao, thus he can care for all things. Third translation, things are easier to control while things are quiet. Things are easier to plan far in advance. Things break easier while they are still brittle. Things are easier hid while they are still small. Prevent problems before they arise. Take action before things get out of hand. The tallest tree begins as a tiny sprout. The tallest building starts with one shovel of dirt. A journey of a thousand miles starts with a single footstep. If you rush into action, you will fail. If you hold on too tight, you will lose your grip. Therefore, the master lets things take their course and thus never fails. She doesn't hold on to things and never loses them. By pursuing your goals too relentlessly, you let them slip away. If you are as concerned about the outcome as you are about the beginning, then it is hard to do things wrong. 
The master seeks no possessions. She learns by unlearning. Thus, she is able to understand all things. This gives her the ability to help all of creation. Final translation. It's easier to maintain balance. Trouble can be nipped in the bud. Fragile things break easily, and small things are easy to lose. Deal with the situation before it becomes a problem. Keep everything straight so it can't get messed up. Every tree was once a seed. Every skyscraper started out with a shovel full of dirt. And stop me if you've heard this one before. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. When you try too hard, you defeat your own purpose. Cling to stuff and you will suffer loss. The masters make no effort, so they never fail. They aren't attached to things, so they never feel lost. People often screw up when the job's nearly done. Pay as much attention to the finishing touches as you do to the initial steps, and you won't screw up like that. The masters try to be free from desire. They don't collect precious things. They don't cling to any beliefs. They pay attention to what everybody else ignores. They help the world get right with Tao, but don't try to change a thing. Thank you, Kate. Thoughts? There's a lot in this one. I mean, a lot of things we've heard before. <clears throat> um, particularly, the, some of the things that stuck out to me were the beginning of a thousand feet, or whatever, starts with one step. I was just talking to somebody about how I was in an AA meeting once. I think I've told you guys this before. And the guy goes, I wanted to do steps one through ten all in that first day. <laughs> and I guess that addict mind, I want it all, I want it now. And, um, like, if I look at, like, I've been in Virginia a little over a year, and I've, I, I don't feel like I'm doing too much every day. But if I look back at where I was a year ago, my God like night and day, different person, different, complete different recovery than, you know, I ever thought it would be. And, um, you know, so that, that really made sense to me. And then also, you know, I always pay attention to those parts of the Tao that talk about not pushing for something, not grasping for something, letting things be as they're meant to be. Um, you know, if I, if I tried to do steps 1 through 12 in one day, I'd fall flat on my face and recover. <laughs> but if you gradually let it come to you and do the small steps and the small things along the way, then um, you build that time. You know, I'm starting to see in all of these two, Lala, there's they're really two, a lot of times, um, two understandings. There's the cognitive understanding, like the fortune cookie understanding. <laughs> and then there's the spiritual understanding. Yeah. You know, so it seems, it seems to be a lot of times there are two of those. And, yeah. and this has both of them there for sure. Yeah. Paul, you have something to? Yeah, this is really the whole one day at a time philosophy as it applies to recovery, right? I mean, uh, I remember when I first got sober, I thought I saw some of these people that had, you know, three or four years sober. And I thought, how, how am I ever going to do that? And I realized pretty early on that the only way I was going to get there was staying sober today. And here it is now. I'm over 10 years sober. And I look back on it like, first of all, where did that 10 years go? <laughs> and then secondly, it's like, wow. That's how you do it. I get it now. Yeah, I was reading Derek Lynn, and he said that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. That quote, my favorite way of saying that that I've heard is um, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Watch your step. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the, I've heard that. And he says that's a misquote, actually. He says what it really says is that the little piece of ground beneath your feet is the starting point of a long journey. 
just like tall trees and great buildings have small beginnings. So basically saying the same thing. But it's, yeah, I look, uh, I, I, yeah, I look at my recovery. I look at all those days as like the foundation that I laid down. And it's, I, I look at it like building a house, you know, mm-hmm. you got to put the foundation in first. And those were my first, that, my first year of recovery was basically laying that foundation down. And, you know, the house won't stand if there's no foundation. So, And there's not an idea, there's not a, a task or a journey or anything that did not begin from a single thought, single step, single action, single intention. Everything originated somewhere. So we never know where, what we're doing, what we're saying, our, where these things are going to lead us. We just have no idea. And y'all have heard me tell about with transitions. I went and visited a guy in the hospital I didn't even like and ended up getting involved in transitions from that single visit. And we sent out emails. It's dailyaaemails.com if any of you guys want to check it out. Um, we, we add five to eight people a day and – all over the world. Now we're an online AA group, got a daily podcast. It's got over, well, it should be over 80,000 downloads now since February. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, and, and we're, we're sending out over 14,000 emails every day of daily devotions that are all the daily devotions in one email. And that goes out every day and all of that stuff I got in, and I got involved with you guys and all this online things I, I've done came from me going and visiting this guy in the hospital on a, on a very cool, cloudy day. I rode my motorcycle 25 miles over to visit him and, uh, and just, it just evolved from there. So you never know when you've got these little things that you do or these steps that you make where they're going to go, nor if when you have an idea, you have, you know, you start moving in a direction, you, you never know where those things are going to go. Well, even, yeah, even me getting involved with this podcast, I, I was just looking for something to listen to at work one day. <laughs> and I thought, well, this sounds kind of interesting. I've never really been into any of this Tao stuff before. And, uh, you know, I was raised a Lutheran in the Midwest. And, you know, we never heard about any of this stuff when I was growing up. So I just started listening to the podcast. I think it was about episode number 20 or so I started listening. And then uh, by episode 45, I decided to jump in, and it's been great. Here you are. Here I am. You're, so you're one of those between 70 and 100 a day that downloaded and listened. Okay. It's just amazing what, what what's available to us if we're just open to just do the next right thing, as we say. You know? That's good. One One thing out of this that really spoke to me was this idea of, I'm at the wrong place, hold on. They pay attention, talking about the sage, to what everybody else ignores. This idea that, and we've heard this in other places in, in the Tao Te Ching, that the, the Tao's tasteless, it's not, anything that someone would want by looking at it. There's not anything attractive about it. It's not the shiny thing, you know, that people want, you know, it's not something you would strive for, you know, it's, it's quite the paradoxical opposite of that, you know? So that whole idea, and I, I'm seeing this as a thread that the, it's the unlearning. It's the letting go is the not grasping. I think that's the spiritual aspect of this chapter, or one of them, is this idea of paying attention. And that only happens when we're spiritually awake to some point, that we can start seeing the things that other people are ignoring or the things that other people feel are insignificant. We can see that they truly are the most significant. That whole idea, I want to think about that as we look at this. Um, one of the big lessons in this, too, is handling things while they're small. 
not letting things get out of control. That's part of the the Confucius side of this. You know, if you wanted to think of the the action we can take. Um, There's a good proverb I just heard from that. Sorry, I don't know if we're still doing that hand raising. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, and this is 500 years old, so I don't know if they believed in dragons back then or not, but um, it's not the dragons that slay us. It's the gnats. The gnats? Gnats. Oh, okay. Okay. And it's true because the big things I take on head on, kind of almost like stress-free, like, okay, this is something I need to do. Let me go deal with it. Let me just take take the bull by the horns. It's those little annoying things that people do, that people say, that I get myself into. Those are the ones that add up to the case of the buckets to me. The big things we kind of know to deal with, yeah. and it's the little things that we ignore they that build. get us, right? Yeah. Hmm. Kirsty? Hold on. Okay. Um, yeah, that I I totally get that because that was um what immediately stuck out to me um because it is it is the the small shit that will trip you up and it it's not necessarily you know i don't know um deaths in families family strife you know these types of things were almost we reach out for support. We we see any crisis is is a is a trigger to go to a meeting to post online. Whereas if my washing machine breaks or there's a there's a almost a, a roller coaster or one thing after another that goes wrong. I might see those things as meaningless. Over time, if those things build up, that is enough to pull, well, I know for me anyway, to push me over the edge. Um, And, you know, that's where I I saw two sides to the, um, the, the idea of looking at things from the small perspective because yes there is this element of everything starts with something really small so we can do anything if we take one step at a time i believe people can achieve great things by just doing the next right thing by keeping it in the day by just doing one task after another as opposed to thinking about the finished project or the 20 years of sobriety or clean time it is about the next hour the next 24 hours um and but at the same time yeah it's the it's the um it's also those really really small things that can trip us up as well um so yeah it's uh, but I mean that's at the beginning. So this, this is so again. There's so much in here. So we've got the the conversation. You know, we've got these two two elements to um, the start of something. But then almost it it flips to the end or the finishing, where it says, when we finish, we don't just kind of let it go and rush it, and um, all of a sudden it's done we still need to maintain that doing the next right thing. And, and it's almost like, right, okay, if we do get to 20 years sober, for me, it was 13 years, you can't take your eye off the ball. You still need to be doing those same things that you were on day one. Because if you don't, then ultimately you probably, you know, experience what happened to me. I relapsed. Because I wasn't doing those basic things that I perhaps did and was so vigilant about in the first day, the first year, the first two years, the first five years. Um, but then also, um, oh, where are we going from here? Um, there's all, yeah, and, and having that vigilance and thinking that you've got it, because it, it, was the, it was the sentence of, 
people usually fail when when they're on the verge of success it is it is my opinion and no people people differ on this that i am constantly in recovery i am not recovered um because i have to work on a daily basis on my recovery i am just someone in recovery that suffers from addiction um i am not i don't consider myself to be recovered because i am still taking my medicine i still have to take my medicine in order to not um lapse and i think also when people do you know with anything think that they've got it that's generally when people start to let go of what's important start to let go of those small things that and they started to do right at the beginning and that's what causes people to slip and fail and just not complete as they probably would have started out um in the in the way they started out if that makes any sense whatsoever there's just so much that i think it's difficult to wrap it up in a little diatribe <laughs> thanks kirsty that was good greg okay so just with, with what kirsty was saying the, the recovered or recovering and um, the big book says that we recovered from a hopeless state of mind um so that's that's why sometimes we, we think we're recovered from um i believe we're always going to be working a program of some sort be it a smart whatever whatever program you work um, and I think it comes down to complacency as well, rather than not working your program. When you start to become complacent is when you start to think that you're in control of your addiction, when you think you've got it, when you think you don't need to do it as much. Um, I usually find that when I need, when I don't need a meeting, that's when I really need to force myself to get to a meeting. I need to drag my ass to a meeting because I start to get complacent. If I, if I text my sponsor to say I can't make, I can't make the meeting tonight, We'll make sure that we firm up another date, and that's one that I have to be held accountable for. I can't just I can't just pick and choose when I want to do when I want to do my steps. Everything every steps on the path. We have to we have to make sure that we're walking that path. If we stray off that path, then who knows where we're going to end up? I think a lot of people when they come into recovery, when when they talk, when they look at doing the twelve steps, and let, let's look at AA for example, they think about doing the twelve steps. A lot of people don't do the steps in order before they even get to a meeting. I had to I had to turn my will and my life over somebody that was bigger than me long before I actually started taking any step work. That's why I got out of this journey starting with every a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. It is true. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in some sort of order. So don't think that just because some people aren't working the same program we're on, that they're not working a program of their own. And I think sometimes we can be blind to what other people are, are working as well. Uh, for everybody's, everybody's journey is different. Everybody has a, a different way of, of doing things. But my main, my main point in this is complacency. That's the complacency is the fear of our addiction. When we start taking shortcuts, when we start making, if you look at building a foundation, you tend to use the better type of material. You use 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 better bricks, better concrete, wherever you make whatever it is you're building. If you start to cut corners and you start using cheaper or things that are going to be less effective, then we're not really going to have that foundation that we can really build our recovery on. And it's not just our recovery that we need to think about as well. It's it's, it's the bigger things. Um, we need to think about our family. We need to think about the different outcomes of our shortcomings as well from not doing things properly. I like what they were talking about. The um, the sage doesn't hold on to things. I th for a long, long time, I was very materialistic. My ego was very money orientated. I had to have everything. I had to have the latest gadget. I had to have the latest car. I had to just whatever it was that came out. I had to have it. And now I'm tending to find the less I have, the more at ease I am because I don't have to keep up with anybody. I found that there's no race. I can take this. I can take this as slow or as quick as I want to. But I'll never be I'll never be rushed into doing something because if I'm rushed into doing something I'm not ready to do, then I know it's not going to be done to the best of my ability. That's what I took out of quite a bit of the towards the end of the readings. Yeah. Great 
Craig, there were, <clears throat> I think we all form our own program, you know, when we, we, I take pieces from everything and put it together and leave some things out and add other things and try not to be religious about any of it. It's so easy to get dogmatic, you know, you got to do it this way. You got to do this, got to do, you know, I think the only thing for me that's essential or for, in my experience has been surrender and surrender has been essential. And that for me came from a dependence of something greater than me. Um, and, and, and I can't surrender without wanting to love and do for people and cleaning up, you know, relationships and getting all that mess cleaned up. Cause that's the first thing I want to do when I start surrendering is I want to make things right with people. I don't want to, I, I don't get angrier when I surrender. I, I get more loving, you know, it's just how it works. I, I mean, I don't try. I just, just is my response. So that's good. It's funny, Thank you. It's funny, it's funny you mentioned surrender because I've started listening to the surrender experiment again. I started listening to it this morning because I was, I was having a restless night. Um, and I just thought, you know what, I need something just to take my mind off things. And the surrender experiment just popped up. So just what you're saying, but taking what works and leaving the rest. The next time we're doing my step work, we can do one, two, and three, skip four, five, give eight a miss as well, because I find that quite difficult. And we just jump on to 12. Is that right? Well, what happens is this. For me, it was I, I made those decisions in the first three steps, and those other steps helped me to do what I decided, helped me to turn my will and my life over to God's care. So that's what the steps are for, because... I learn by doing things with y'all. I, I don't learn by myself in a cave meditating. My life, it's that interaction with people that causes me. I never get ill and angry when it's just me. It, I'll get ill and angry when I have to deal with somebody that's not doing what I think they should do. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's how, just how it works. So, um, And this is about how we behave while walking the path, too. These ideas of the sage are about how the, the sage doesn't force things to completion. Pursuing your goals too relentlessly, they slip away. Uh, he has nothing, thus he has nothing to lose. That word for nothing is one way to look at that is, is a meaning of self-interest. So he has no self-interest. So he's not attached to things. It's not that he doesn't have things or he's not have goals or he's, you know, he, he's not, that, it's not that he's not busy doing. It's just that he's doing in such a way that his expectations are low. He is not forcing. He's at ease. Tina? Hold on, Tina. Let me mute you. You got it? Okay. This, um, this was reminding me a little bit of last week's in the 63rd chapter um, when they were reminding us to, um, it was more or less oh, about letting problems slide, um, act without doing, practice non-action. Um, and it was a little bit of a continuation, which I like, because I like to have things um, repeated to me in different ways. Um, for me, it, I could also put it in context of of the difference between my first four years of sobriety, the relapse, and now. Um, you know, my my sponsor. I, I worked with her most of the time, and she said, "You know, there really is something different this time about you." And the thing that I'm feeling is that I don't know. I don't have the answers. Um, I was getting too confident in myself, which I always thought was a good thing because I, that's how I'd always lived, thinking you fake it till you make it, I got this, you just stay confident, it's, it's your attitude. But I'm learning, it's funny how my, I feel like they're seeing here also that a human's natural instincts, are, it's kind of the opposite of what you need to do, which makes sense to me because I've always ran on self-will and whatever I think is right. And I'm finding now that I needed to be humbled. I needed to remind myself that no matter how much I think I have it, 
and, and listening to people who've been there that they that you don't really have it. You keep trying every day with everything you do. Um, and so that's what, and it's peaceful. It's almost a, um, I feel like a, it's like the first time I heard somebody say, you're not responsible for the world's happiness. You're not responsible for other people's happiness. And I cried the day I heard that. I had never heard that. I'd never considered it an option. No one had ever said that to me. And it's the same kind of relief I feel by thinking I don't know anything, even when I think I do. It's kind of like, so it's not that big of a deal that I can relax because it's in the just day by day, the small things. Um, and buddy, I like when you when you're talking about how to eat an elephant. Um, you know, it grossed me out at first, but then <laughs> I've used it like twice this week. <laughs> it's just the best way to put it. <laughs> um, yeah, this is these are just great things in here, and I could relate a lot of them um, to to the twelve steps actually. And to me, that because I need a plan of action, I think this is all great enlightenment. Myth enlightenment but I loved having for me in my recovery the 12 steps to go back to um, about about like resentments don't cling to things um, treat every problem like a small one trying too hard defeats the purpose um, I don't know it was all just good stuff for me and I, I it's a relief to hear this I don't don't you see some correlations between the powerlessness that we learn in recovery versus the push or the how you worked in your effort to stop your addiction. Then when you finally learn how to be powerless, how that ease that came, I think that's the transition from the force, the push to, to letting go and surrendering and, the non-desire part of this or the non-action part of this is the surrender. It's not that we don't have action. It's what our action is about, you know. Kate? Uh, All right. So I was thinking about, uh, you know, what I used to think was important you know, is so different than what I think is important now. And um, so looking at the verse, he has nothing, unless he has nothing to lose. You know, I used to think what I had, not like what I had, like physically, but how I looked to people was the most important thing. You know, so I had my... I worked in science and I had my science job and I walked around being like, I'm a scientist, you know, and thinking like I'm smarter than everybody. I can do science, you know? And I was, I mean, I wasn't like a very high up scientist, but I thought like I can say this to people and everyone will think like, wow, look at her, you know? And so I had that job and, you know, I thought I had to like impress everybody with, my achievements, basically. And now it's so different. Now I'm in recovery. What I think is important is so different. But I still have that little part of myself that wants, like, wants to be prestigious in some way, you know? And so part of me, even in, in my recovery, so the part about in this about forcing a project to completion, you ruin what was almost right. Like, I almost feel like I, I'm trying to force my recovery into being something that looks good to people or I'm not doing it quite well enough and it needs to look, it's how it looks to people. Like, how is it appearing rather than looking at how, how is it actually working for me? You know, and that, Good. that's something that I struggle with a lot with, with my recovery, because, you know, I know they, 
in actuality, it's not, that's not what's important about my recovery. And obviously that's not going to help me. Like, how is she looking? She's looking great. Then I'm going to be like wasted on the street, you know, that's not going to help me. But that's kind of what my, I have that little tendency. That's good, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. I think we all have, I know I have those ego little ego enclaves, you know, that are hard to, you know, that are hard to get to. Um, and I have to, I'm on, I'm on guard for those, just like you're talking about. But that's a good observation. Good observation. How about this idea? What if we notice what is being igno- ignored by others in a situation? How about the next time we get in a, a situation that's disturbing us, how we, there's things that, that are ignored. That's where the solution is, is in those ignored things. Um, one thing I've really noticed with that is me learning not to take things personally. If there's a rule And I don't like the rule. They didn't make that rule just for Buddy. It's just a rule. You know, I I took some trash to the dump the other day, and he didn't want to allow us to me to dump because I had it was not fitting there. And I said it's not going. Wanted me to take it somewhere else. And I was like, come on, you know. And I started getting ill because it didn't matter. You know, it's just his little thing. You know, it's their little rules. I'm like. So I started getting ill and I really took me a while to get over it. And I was like, wait a minute, they're not doing this to buddy. This is just their rules. How can I appreciate the job this guy's doing? How can I flip this around again? Like I have to every time (laughs) if I want to be happy used to, I would have gotten ill and irate and started cussing them, and they'd have threatened to call the police to kick me. I mean, I would have just went haywire over trash, you know. And so this time I caught myself. I started down that road a little. I didn't cuss anybody. But it was like almost that, do you know who I, that kind of stuff, you know, started coming up, you know. And I was like, whoa. And so I left. And it's just funny, the littlest of things. Who was talking about that, Lala, about the small stuff? And this makes no difference at all. And so it took me hours to get back to some, not, and I didn't, I didn't even get 100% back. And the next day, I was having to pray about it the next morning. I had these guys to my prayer list that morning because I was still holding on to it a little bit. And it's trash. And I'm like, come on, buddy. You know, but that's that's the way this works. But you know, or I could just be offended and flip them the bird every time I go by the dump, you know, and because I go by there and dump my trash, you know, I mean, it could just go, well, I get used to and not talk to them forever. You know, again, I speak to them every time I say, you know, I got to say hello the next time I take my trash off. I've got these are guys I see all the time, you know, and I'm like, oh, so, but I automatically started getting some relief from that. And I think that's part of this not holding on to stuff, not possessing, not pursuing, uh, not having the self-interest. And the thing that I was ignoring was the fact that they were not doing that to me. And once I realized that, it started lightening up. Because like I've said before, everything's personal. I take everything personally. You know, if if something's not right, they're doing it to me. And I had no idea how much of life I formed into personal things. And everything and then then I realized nothing was personal. They're not doing that to me. They, that's just a rule. They do that to everyone that comes in there. That anyone that came in with the same situation would have been treated the same way. So, you know, that whole thing and I've learned I'm learning. Uh, and that that's part of this, too. But I've got to look and notice where my ego is popping in. And the because really, now how about this one here? At the end, it talks about that the sage simply reminds people 
of who they have always been. So the sage is not bringing a solution. He's just reminding, they already have the solution. When I think about that, I think about how we're told that, you know, when we're looking for God, that we start looking within for for what we need. Our answers are all there. We take the light and turn it around, right? Tina? Um, yeah, and I had heard something interesting. It's a it's one way to look at things. Last week at a workshop that, that said, um, she, the woman conducting it said, anything that I say to you that resonates with you or that you have that aha moment is something that you've already known. You're just remembering. And I really like that because it made me feel like, you know, I hear this profound thing and it's like deep down I've I've already, I've always known that, but someone's reminding it to me and I'm like, oh yeah. Um, That and I always have to leave this meeting a few minutes early to get my little guy to school, but um, I was reading, it was a little hard read for me, Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. And um, maybe I just wasn't ready for it, kind of like Eckhart Tolle. I tried to read when I was 21. And <laughs> I'll just let it look cool on my shelf. We'll yeah. leave it at that. Um, <laughs> let Kate bar it when she needs to look good. She can, she can put your, uh, <laughs> Eckhart Tolle out there like she's been reading it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I went to a conference of his or a, a talk he gave, and he was giving these top 14 things that all spiritual people do. So everyone's, you know, listening, got their pen out. But um, his help wasn't the best, so he couldn't finish it. So it's it's online. But he the, the said he said, the thing I want you guys to know the most out of my entire talk is your problems have already been solved for you, which I thought was amazing and it's kind of sums this up to me i mean why are we working so hard to do something that's already i mean we just need to do the small things what's going to unfold is going to unfold um so yeah that's good thank you thank you tina you know what reminded me of what you were saying i was thinking about that if if the sage reminds people who they've always been how that relates to our spiritual awakening that we find in recovery and how we've always had these solutions. We were just not awake to those solutions because if you look at the 12 steps, it says having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. So the whole goal is to wake us up spiritually to what's going on around us and how to handle our situations because our life is all really about our perception and how we see it, and that changes as we start learning spiritual principles. How about this line at the end of Mitchell's translation that says, he cares about nothing but the Tao, thus he can care for all things. So he reminds people of who they've always been. It's not like he's got magic solutions. He just reminds them of who they've been. Is that not what you do with the steps? You just remind people of who they've been the whole time. He cares about nothing but the Tao. Thus, he can care. Because he cares about nothing but the Tao, he can care for all things. Um, and I made a note of that, that care for all things is the way that we unlearn. That's the way that we give up this idea of having all the solutions. When I care for people, I have to let go of my self-interest. I can't care for you and care for me at the same time. You know, I can't, you know, I I can't be all about me and my selfishness and be loving you at the same time. I mean, it's going to be one or the other for me. Either I'm looking out for me or I'm trying to do for you. You know, that both of those don't work together for me in reality. So this idea that when we care for others, we're cared for, that's how we surrender our life. And that's how we learn to be able to care for other people. That's how, that's how I'm seeing it. That's good. Any comments? Mitchell's translation, Mitchell says that he cares about nothing but the Tao. 
what he's talking about there is not to say that he doesn't love his wife, children, friends, country, planet, but he sees them in the proper perspective of eternity. And since he and his wife love the Tao even more than they love each other, their marriage is radiant with love. This is the meaning of the biblical verse, you shall love the unnameable, your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. So if we have our priorities right on with who we're loving, I mean, I can't turn my will and my life over to the care of God and over to the care of my wife at the same time. When I turn my will and my life over to God's care, I'm a better husband. I do the right things. Good. I'm just looking through to see if I have any other comments. Anything, guys? Pay attention to what's, <clears throat> excuse me, pay attention to what's ignored. The paradox of the value of the ignored portion. That was one of my thoughts about that. What we ignore is the most significant. Good. You have anything from Wayne Dyer today, Craig? that we can hit really quick? There's quite a lot in Wayne Dyer. Um, I think the, 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 fir the first part of it kind of sums it all up in a nutshell. I'll just, I'll just skim, through, skim through some of it. So he says, A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It's the most famous line of the entire Tao Te Ching. It's quoted so often because it encourages us to avoid procrastination and just begin from where we are right here, right now. A tiny seed planted and nurtured grows into a forest. A marathon begins by taking the first stride. He then goes on to give a little bit that says, re-examine how you view the challenges you face, as well as those of your family, community and country. Sense in your heart how easily preventable many of them are when you deal with things before they exist. So this is I'm talking about dealing with things before they, before they actually happen. Um, he says there's three steps to enlightenment that most people uh, traverse. The first is through suffering, which is when a big problem in your life becomes so over, over, uh, overwhelming that a long period of misery ensues because you treasure what is difficult to attain. The second is by being in the present moment. Here you've moved closer to the day by asking yourself when a crisis erupts, what do I have to learn from this experience right now? And the third is by getting out in front of big problems. This means you act before difficulties occur, sense disorder coming your way, and manage it in advance. This is the way of the doubt. The small is easily scattered, says Lao Tzu. So here's the acute observer who's totally in tune with nature. With foresight, you anticipate an argument, play it out in your mind in a split second, and are able to neutralize the negative energy because you are in front of it. So he's saying the three, the three aspects of this for him was uh, suffering being present being present and, and getting, getting out, out in front of big problems yeah okay so what, what, what again from the from the third one just who was talking about um, with foresight you anticipate an argument it takes me back to listen to the surrender experiment where Mickey Singh is talking about um, where he gets called to the principal's office um, and th that, that voice in his head said, right, that's it, you're in trouble now, you're doing this, you're doing that, and it's listening to that voice, and it's, what he does is he just surrenders to that voice, and he doesn't pay any heed. He just basically goes with what's in front of him there and then. He has, he has no control over what's went on in the past, and he can't control what goes on in the future, and that's my biggest take from this verse is that there's the two days that we can't do anything about, yesterday and tomorrow, let's, let's deal with what comes up today. You know, and another translation of that, um, he reminds people, is that he brings men back to what they have lost. And isn't that what we do when we share with someone in recovery? We talk about our experience. We don't tell them how to do it or have the solution. I mean, when I'm talking to a sponsee or someone in recovery, I never really have their solution. I just tell them what I did. And in me telling them what I did, then – they can maybe draw from that as to what they need to do or can do if they choose to. So it's really a reminding them of the solutions they already have, changing their mindset, you know, changing the way they're looking at the situation. It's like me, instead of being angry with somebody, how, what can I be grateful for in them? 
Paul, like back to your gratitude, you know, that same idea of shifting this around. And when you think about it, those, those great epiphanies never happen with these huge words of wisdom. They always happen with things like that for me. Oh, I can be great. Whoa. When I do the simplest thing of being grateful for someone, then it lifts this anger and resentment that I have. Yeah. It's all, it's all about perspective, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of times you just have to look at it from a different angle and all of a sudden something that baffled you can just all of a sudden can make perfect sense. And we see the red flags of pushing and striving and the stress and being disturbed. If I'm disturbed in any way, what? I've got to look at me. Yeah, it's you. Because my perspective has to change. It kind of brings to mind a saying that if if you're struggling to see the forest for the trees, then study the trees for a little while. But just what Buddy was saying about people finding themselves again, I don't know about anybody else in recovery, but I was was the thing that was lost. I'd, I'd lost myself. I'd lost that connection with myself because I was I was so focused on what was going on around me. You had to pay attention to what you'd been ignoring, right? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what I was needing. Exactly. Good stuff. That's all I have, guys. Is there any closing comments or we close there? Everyone good? All right. Well y'all have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. For more information about the SRC, go to the sharepodcast.com, share is spelled S H A I R, and look for the Share Recovery Community link. When you join the SRC, you will be able to participate in this meeting and many more live, plus access to a video library of past meetings and many more benefits for being a part of this growing community. Thanks again for listening, and if you enjoyed this episode, Please share this podcast with your friends in recovery.